What's up, YouTube? I'm here again with a chance to interview a pair of mine that works at Lockheed Martin. This is a huge aerospace company with um, their headquarters located in the Washington, D.C. area. They have over 100,000 employees and engineers, um, but they have facilities all throughout the United States of America. They design um, aircrafts and other military components, but my specific peer, he works in, on radar systems, and I'm excited to interview, so stay tuned. Lockheed Martin is an aerospace defense company headquartered in the Washington, D.C. area. Their main divisions include aeronautics, missile and fire control, rotary and mission systems, and the space systems division. They've developed some of the most advanced military aircrafts in aviation history. This includes the legendary SR-71 Blackbird, the F-22 Raptor, and the F-35 Lightning II. The Rotary and Mission Systems Division is where the Naval Radar Systems and the avionics for their fighter aircrafts are designed and manufactured. These radars are used to detect enemy threats and can be deployed both on the ground and in aircraft systems. With over 100,000 employees, Lockheed Martin has been a staple of excellent engineering for over 20 years. Before I get to the interview, if you guys could hit that like and subscribe button, I would greatly appreciate it. But uh, stay tuned, I got some good content. Um, what's up, YouTube? Uh, I have a peer here that I'm excited to interview. Um, he works at Lockheed Martin, and I'll let him introduce himself. So uh, can you introduce yourself and then uh, also your job title and where you work? Sure. Uh, so my name is Griffin Kearney. Uh, I'm a senior systems engineer at Lockheed Martin up in Syracuse, New York. Uh, so that's, that's sort of the high level gist. If you really want to get into it, because uh, systems engineering is a pretty big bubble, I, I'm more of like an analyst, uh, algorithms development sort of guy. So a lot of math, a lot of applied math, that that realm of of stuff. Gotcha, gotcha. And which department do you work in? Like uh, I know you're a system engineer for radar systems. Or... Yeah. So I I work I work under so I work on radar systems, um, and I don't know how much about Lockheed you know. So Lockheed's a huge company, so there's lots mm -hmm. of little subdivisions. Uh, I technically work under IWSS is the the subgroup that i'm i'm part of okay gotcha yeah because i think i remember when i was in syracuse that they took us to a plant nearby and that they worked on radar systems there weren't any uh other aerospace systems that you guys work on in that region are they uh so syracuse is mainly a radar hub Radar, uh, okay so, okay and and there's a few other radar companies up here as well um so the lockheed up here this is our main radar hub it's one of the bigger lockheed facilities Oh, okay. It's so radar is technically under the the part of Lockheed that would be considered RMS. So it's something like rotary and mission systems, um, and so that's one of the really big groups. And so RMS Syracuse is is a big chunk of that. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, so getting into what it's like working at Lockheed. So like, what are your day to day duties consist of? What is it like? You know, typical morning to evening uh, job duties. Right. Well, so post pandemic life uh, is a bit more hybrid than I think it used to be. So I do work remotely a little bit of the time, uh, mostly in person. Uh, and that's because of the nature of the job working in defense, there's still a lot of in-person requirements. So if you're gonna get into the defense industry through like a, a Northrop, Lockheed, Raytheon, or some of the smaller subcontractors, uh, expect that there's gonna be some, some in-person stuff. But um, a lot of my job at the highest levels is uh, programming, but it wouldn't be like a software development sort of deal. It's more like I, I tend to play around in MATLAB a lot or sometimes like a Python, uh, developing algorithms, prototyping algorithms, testing algorithms, uh, things like that, right? That's pretty cool. Wow. I mean, that, that does sound a lot more technical than some of the other positions that I've heard of. So what do you think are the top, you know, three engineering skills that you actually use from academia? Like, to, what do you think helps the most for the position you currently have? Sure. I, I'm going to answer it two prong. So I'm going to I'm going to first speak more toward like what systems engineers or a senior systems engineer would do. Yeah. Do that. And then I'll get I'm a I'm a, a weird one. Right. I've got a particular background in math. So they give me some really specific tasking that I'll get into a little bit. Um, so systems engineers generally are like the folks who are going to get, you know, all the all the the macroscopic view of a system and glue it together. So there's a lot of like architectural stuff that you might do as a systems engineer or a systems architect. So 
and that you're like defining the way that um, various parts of the system, what they'll be responsible for, like what's hardware going to do in this case, what's firmware going to do potentially, and what are those interfaces going to look like? How are those things being passed back and forth? Part of what goes into supporting that is stuff like systems requirements. So you've probably you know dealt with those sorts of things where you'd say, hey, the system shall do this and within such and such you know tolerances, and those will generally be developed in like a conversation with a customer. So I, it's not uncommon that we'll find ourselves talking to customers directly potentially to support business development folks. Um, now for my stuff specifically, when you get outside of that, that really high level functional stuff, um, I tend to get charged with certain um, algorithm design. So I do a lot of digital signal processing and I develop a lot of algorithms to do digital signal processing. And um, when I'm doing that, it ends up being, uh, like, hey, we have this radar data. We need to do this. We need to be able to process this radar data to do such and such a task. And I can't get too into detail on what those tasks look like because of you know, the defense industry being what it is. But yeah. it's a lot of like, okay, they give me you know representative data streams or maybe measured data streams, and I know maybe some of the parameters that went into generating that. And then once that's happened. I have to write some code to do some math magic on it to say, hey, there's a plane up there, or um, you know, there's not a plane up there, stuff like that. So I tend to be doing a lot of the applied math. And as you guess, digital signal processing, you're gonna be looking at a lot of like Fourier transforms, general signal processing techniques. I remember that. I, I get into a little bit more of a, like an optimization flair. So my graduate work was in a lot of optimization and optimization methods. So like, think like optimal control style stuff, but I'm using optimal control techniques applied to digital signal processing methods. Right. So that's that's sort of from a high level down to specifically what I do in my little math cube. Ah, gotcha, gotcha. So that sounds really interesting. I mean, since you're doing so much technical work that involves math, um, coding, and integrating different systems together, how much freedom do you have with with how you structure it, do you have? I know when in my company, whenever I make any sort of design changes, there's like a procedure I have to follow. I can only I have to stay within certain guidelines. It sounds like they do they give you a lot of room, and you're you're really given as much bandwidth as you need to to, to, to sort of create the code that you need, or, or there's certain guidelines. It's it's definitely it's definitely a back and forth. Uh, so I I think that it really boils down to being more like a conversation. So. I tend to not be so involved in the drafting of requirements or specifications for a system. I tend to have the requirements passed down to me of saying, hey, we need algorithms that behave this well. This way. And mm. I'll I'll play around with that. You try to hit those methods. If you run into the circumstances where it's like, hey, this, this requirement is unreasonable. Um, it's not that I can just go, oh, that's too hard. We're not going to do it. It's like, <laughs> hey, so prototyping off of this and like looking at existing systems in house this is more or less like the performance we think we're going to be able to achieve without taking on a lot of extra risk. Uh, and so sometimes there's a back and forth where you'll say, hey, this needs to change potentially. Like maybe we take this back, we revise. Um, I think that what you're talking about with this individualism is that on my stuff, I tend to have a pretty good amount of room to run, but it's because of what specific tasking I'm doing and because I'm in the role of being a senior engineer at this point. Right. So when you get to that level of like a senior systems engineer, senior hardware engineer, senior software engineer, it's where they start giving you a little more autonomy on how it actually yeah. gets executed. I get given a like a feature like, hey, it needs to do this. We yeah. trust you to make it happen. Mm -hmm. You know, gotcha. you know what the system has to like, what the system limitations are. Make sure that you're not like trying to put a supercomputer on it, but, <laughs> but do what you got. So that's that's gotcha. how I describe it. That totally makes sense. That totally makes sense. Okay. So yeah. going on to the next question, what do you think you like the most about working at your position? Uh, so I definitely like the work I do. Uh, I am a manager. That's good. Uh, as you know, <laughs> from I remember that. PA. So uh, it has only gotten worse. The more the more I've been here, the, the heavier into, you know, more sophisticated mathematics, tech, uh, analytic techniques um, I got into. And I found some really novel applications for them, which has been good for my career. I mean, uh, I'm so uh, I, I got hired on Lockheed as a senior engineer because they wanted some of that experience I had in digital signal processing. Before I was at Lockheed, I was at a smaller company here who did radar called SRC. They were formerly associated with um, 
with uh, SU. So it, it uh, used to be Syracuse Research Corporation, but then they split off and became their own company. So I worked with them for a while and I got some good experience under my belt. And then Lockheed hired me because of the experience that I uh, cultivated there and some of those unique ways I found to use analytic techniques and digital signal processing for modern radar. Uh, so what I like about my job is that they tend to let me run with that because there's not many people who do the sort of math that I do. Uh, uh, so I'm given a lot of, it's almost like creative flexibility, right? Folks don't say, well, like, hey, prove out this algorithm to me ahead of time. They're like, you think you can do it? You know, you, you're, you're the guy who creates <laughs> a crazy math program and it runs and it does what we want. So why don't you go ahead and do that? And then we'll just, we'll touch base once you're done with it. And so that, that freedom, that flexibility, that sort of autonomy, which is part of the reason that I work, um, my individual task I tend to do like alone uh, uh, is a pro because I still get to collaborate with people, but it ends up being collaboration, like in the sense of uh, like, you know, you, you bounce ideas off another subject matter expert, something like that to like get the conversation going, fill in some gaps that maybe I have. But ultimately I get to own my piece of the algorithm and do that. And I like that independence and that, um, that ability to sort of drive the way that it gets executed. Man, that's really cool, man. I mean, because one, you said you like what you do. And you said you, uh, I know you were a big math nerd and it sounds like you get to take what you learned in academia and apply it and also have the creativity, the autonomous, you know, ability to sort of have your own impact. And that's, I, that sounds cool because I'm trying to get to that point. You know, obviously I'm still kind of earlier in my career and it can be tough to get to those very technical positions. Typically you have to have the credentials or the experience. So I admire that a lot, man. And that's, that's, it's, I just got a four year lead on you. You'll be there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm getting there. I'm definitely getting there. But yeah. uh, going to the flip side, you know, there's always pros and cons. What do you think you like the least about working for a defense company? I, Lockheed's a big company. <laughs> yes, you know, big, it's big. It's a massive company. So um, the same way that I, I like my flexibility, my autonomy on the, the small side of things, when you have to, um, when you have to branch outside of that, when you got to, when you got to uh, work through the Lockheed processes, uh, it can be a little slow, right? You gotta, yeah, yeah. There, there tends to be a lot of people you have to get, a lot of stakeholders that need to buy in on major decisions. It can take a long time to get them all in the same room because they're all over the country, potentially all over the world. Um, and Lockheed has a lot of resources and a lot of different programs that it does. So when it's like, hey, someone told me that this other program is doing this thing that we're supposed to know about and at least, you know, develop a, a uh, like a case study for, is it applicable to our system? Why or why not? And there can be a lot of lead time in that where it's like, ah, oh, man, I really wish we're moving quicker. Um, that, that comes, that con comes with a list of pros, right? So by the same token, because Lockheed's such a big company, they're very, very well funded. They have very well-defined processes. So when you're moving up, right it's the expectations are set pretty well right it's not this scrappy startup sort of sphere yeah and i look i i also like the startup space so don't get me wrong but Lockheed does the opposite so you've got stability right yeah there's chances are chances are the company's not gonna run out of money overnight <laughs> yeah uh, and, uh... and they got good benefits they've got well-defined processes so there's not there's a set of headaches that you trade off in this case. So, well, for me, that's that's the headache that I feel. Sort of grass is always greener because I'm not feeling the startup headaches right now. I'm not working at a startup company. Mm. Yeah, I always say that's the trade off is with big companies, you're gonna have the stability, you know, yeah. a, a sort of clear path forward up the, up the chain. Uh, you're gonna have the benefits, but you're not, you might not necessarily have some of the, as much of excitement or, you know, putting on different hats that you would at a startup, but it's all trade offs. Yeah. But going on, like, what do you, have you seen, what's the coolest thing you've seen? Have you, have you been able to witness um, the production part of seeing these uh, radar filled or is there anything cool you've seen traveling? Uh, so I, I actually don't travel for work very much. Generally us math nerds stay remote. Uh, yeah. Phone, phone call or email if we have to reach someone who's far away. Um, uh, I will say modern radar is pretty neat. The stuff that you can do with a modern radar is pretty cool. Uh, I Lockheed is, I can say for certain, at least one of the largest radar contractors. They might be the largest radar contractor at this point. I don't follow the business quite that close to know how well Northrop or Raytheon are doing as they're sort of our two big competitors. Um, but the 
so a lot of a lot of work is being done right now in modernization, right? We're trying to take what used to be uh, largely analog radar systems and move them into these very very modern digital or at least hybrid digital radar systems. And the reason that that's happening is you're starting to see all these cool things like you know 30 series GPUs and stuff come out. Turns out that you can use this stuff to do all sorts of digital architecture. So there's lots of really neat stuff being done on the radar sphere, specifically in digital radar that I'm working on that I think is super neat. And I apologize, I have to be a little bit vague just because the- uh, the, the nature the of power, it. Yeah, big brother will get on my case. <laughs> they call him, I gotta find out who this guy is. Secrets. No, I totally get it. I don't wanna get you or the company in trouble. Do you have a clearance, can you say? Uh, I would prefer not to say. No, nope, there's no problem. Uh, but, but I will, so on a boiler boilerplate, uh, defense work, there's definitely a variety of clearances that you'll need to get potentially, um, yeah. depending on what you work on. Uh, most of the ones with radar aren't too high octane. Um, mm -hmm. If you start getting into other, if you start working for like the three letter agencies, some of those can get yeah pretty, uh, pretty intense. Yeah, yeah, I bet, I bet, I yeah. bet. No, it's interesting what you said. Uh, everything is kind of moving from analog to digital, and especially with, like you said, that the how the these GPU graphic technologies, how they're being integrated in, you know, AI software and it sounds like in radar systems. It's really interesting to see where where it goes. Uh, I don't know a ton about these radar systems. Um, are these are these land based radars that you're working on, like the ones that they pop up in the middle? And then they could detect missiles and things coming, or are these ones that go on aircrafts? Uh, so we we do the whole thing. Lockheed, oh. does, Lockheed right. does all sorts of ones. Um, and it it sort of depends on where the algorithms get deployed. Right? Oh, okay. And so so uh, at the stage that I'm at, um, tough, tough to say exactly which which specifically will end up on. That'll be like mission needs, things of that nature. Because I'm, I tend to be someone who's developing capabilities. Oh, okay, okay, okay. I get what you're saying. I yep. get what you're saying. Yeah, because I, okay, interesting. Um, so, getting into Lockheed, I have some questions for you. Yep. So, what was, well, I know you said you had some experience from another company that helped, helped you get in. Like, what was the application process? Like, did you apply online? Did you have, did you know people in there, kind of hand your resume to somebody? How, did, how was that application process like for you? Yeah, so I, like I said, there's a pretty lively radar community up here in Syracuse. Um, so there's Lockheed's up here, uh, Saab, Saab Census is up here, and yep. SRC is up here. So those are some of the major players. Uh, there tends to be a lot of cross-pollination between them, right? So as opportunities open up, it's not uncommon to, you sort of know, a few folks in everywhere, right? Because you 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 shift around depending on what business needs are and how well they line up with your your talents. So Lockheed recently secured um, like some good radar contracts in the last like decade and or so that have been pushing it forward in these initiatives. And they needed folks with my experience in like algorithm design for DSP that sort of uh, arena. And so they. Uh, that that ultimately i knew someone over at Lockheed who said hey they need people like this so they pushed my name in, into the the ticker and that's when the conversation started all right so just right place right time and you have the right skills yeah if you uh, want to do radar syracuse is a great syracuse, place to live. gotcha what do you think made you stand out the most as an applicant i you might be giving me too much credit i think that <laughs> i had a good set of skills that they were pretty hungry for i that think they're, they're still hungry for, for that if you're someone who has experience in digital signal processing, the radar industry is really lively right now. Uh, so don't be afraid to come apply to, you know, Lockheed, specifically the Syracuse area. There's some other radar stuff that's done in some other locations, uh, specifically down in New Jersey. I know is another big Lockheed radar site. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, right, right now they're just hungry for DSP engineers in, in that sort of systems umbrella, right? So uh great space to be in and um in terms of going into expectations versus reality it's always something i like, I like to get into you know how do you think the industry differs from academia from your perspective uh, majorly. <laughs> i majorly i agree right 
so when 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 yeah. we were hanging out, uh, I was probably still thinking that I was going to stick to academia because oh man, it's so much fun to do research and you yeah, know, I would academia I think is more akin to like being those uh, those torture artists. You really got to love it and you really got to love only doing it is my opinion. True. Um, True. As in the hours tend to be very very demanding, um, and that's sort of. Uh, I would describe that as necessary, right? In academia, it's unusual to not sort of be really committed and pouring yourself into your research and your teaching. Whereas with industry, uh, well, it's there are plenty of folks who like their job and like to spend more than like the 40 hour work week on it. Industry gives you that ability to really have sort of those cutoffs because it let me develop other parts of my life that I really appreciate. So I think that mm. that that stability, that benefits package we talked about with Lockheed, the, the work-life balance is healthier, in my opinion, than academia. Right. So oh. you know, I can, you know, I get my nights myself to, to do YouTube uh, interviews and I can go rock climbing and I can go out to all these new restaurants in Syracuse and this sort of stuff. And in academia, sometimes that's tough. <laughs> <laughs> that's how I describe no. it. <laughs> no, I remember undergrad and especially grads, as, as you got deeper and deeper into deeper studies, it just got more and more intellectually draining and it, it requires so much time to do research, pass yeah. your classes, have a job. So I, I, that's a great way you put it, how, you know, in the industry, like you said, the biggest difference is you, you people aren't as, like you said, intense. Uh, you have, you know, more of a balance. And like you said, oh, my coworkers got me into rock climbing. I'm into camping. I'm into jujitsu. I'm doing yeah. all these things. You get to have that balance. Yeah, that's that's the sort of thing because it it, I, it exists both sides of the coin. But I find that the academics tend to be very, very rightfully so committed to their work, committed to their work, and they will they don't they don't really have that desire to clock out. What I've noticed in the really good yeah is that they're always in that mode. Like you can tell when this is like, hey, that's a professor because <laughs> there's no there's not, there's not really there's another no. gear. If there's another gear. Then you're like, well, they're a professor, but they're not, they're not like sitting as a dean or anything like that. It's not that that intensity to really thrive there. Whereas in engineering, in engineering industry specifically, it's more like uh like you you run into those sharp people, but those sharp people tend to have a lot more dimensions to them. Where like you look, yeah. oh, that guy knows a ton about radar, but we're also talking about what craft brew we like. Yeah, that's a <laughs> that sort of stuff. <laughs> That's a great way to put it. In the industry, there's a lot more dimensions. And you yeah. know what I think? You know, you know who I think of when I think of Syracuse when you describe the professor? I think of John Danahoffer. Just that. that, that. <laughs> great professor. He's a great, great, great professor, but he's laser focused. But that guy, 100%, he could do it 100% of the time. 100%. Sleep just, just gets in the way of him wanting to do more of his research and teach and all that sort of stuff. And that's what makes him a great professor as mm -hmm. compared to what makes folks uh what i what i find is the most impressive among folks in industry that i find is that they can do an immense amount in 40 hours right they might be mm. able to outside of it but you you see these folks and you're like wow they're just they're effective in that time zone i think part of the reason that they're effective in that time window is because they can turn off right so it's mm. more of that on off cycle versus that constant churning that you see in the academics I agree with that. Do you feel like you're challenged as much? You know, I would say the biggest thing for me when I thought when I, for me personally, when I got into the industry, I felt like the work wasn't nearly as hard as academia. But I know for you, you're in a very technical position where you actually are applying a lot of that theoretical knowledge. But do you feel like there was a drop off, you know, intellectually in terms of how much you actually had to think? Well, I, I would say I would say no. Ultimately, mm. but I think that's sort of because of some actions that I've taken. Um, mm. so I knew that I had this skill set and I wanted, like, I know that that's something that brings some really unique value to what I can bring as an, as like a, an engineer. And so I seek out those problems. I'm not afraid to, to sort of be like, hold on, you know, give me a week. I can do something impressive with this. And so, so I've, I've intentionally sort of built that reputation. It started in SRC. That's part of the reason that I got the gig at Lockheed and I've continued that trend. Um, which has led to me getting more intellectually stimulating assignments, which I prefer, right? Because yeah. it's not the difficulty of it 
when we talk about things like academia that I wanted to shy away from, it's the constantly having to be on, right? I want to be able to yeah. put it down sometimes. Put it down. When I'm at work, I don't want to be bored. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So, so I think I think you have it both directions. There's 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 nothing that says you have to seek that out. Like you don't have to constantly be trying to do these brain buster problems if you don't want to. There's definitely support structures and a lot of important work that has to get done that's not going to sort of fit that bill. But if you want to do that, uh, there's definitely opportunities to find it. Gotcha. Up up here at Lockheed. Gotcha. Gotcha. I like what you said about you know you, you you what you set yourself up specifically to get these more technical positions. Yeah. And especially since you have your PhD, right? I do not quite yet. I'm not the. Oh. I'm still, oh. Okay. Okay. I'm still a non-traditional student, so that. Oh. Okay, okay. That that furthers the point about the uh, academia was taxing. So in, yeah. In 2019, I I decided to go to a, a really casual conti continuation of study. And gotcha. So I'm I'm doing. A little bit of the academic stuff, um, like nights, weekends, that sort of model. Gotcha. Um, gotcha. And so as I do that, of course, COVID happened the year following, which threw more wrenches into it. That's yeah. Really gone out the <laughs> but eventually, hopefully, I will be, you know, done with it. I totally get it. I totally get it. But if you had to pick three skills that you think a younger version of you would learn in this era we live in right now, 2021, with everything that's going on in terms of computer science becoming more relevant or mm -hmm. AI. What would you say those three things you would have focused on more in academia if you're speaking to a freshman or sophomore? So let's let's talk three three pillars. I uh, mm -hmm. I think that so we'll knock the pick something technical you really want to know. Mm -hmm. Right. So for me that's applied math. I, I wanted to be good at applied math. So you want to get that that background. So if you go, you know, get a degree in electrical engineering. You're going to know a little bit about circuits, you're going to know a little bit about signal processing, you're going to know a little bit about control systems, this sort of stuff. Have that background, but pick one of those things that you really like and go work in that space, get good at it, or go to grad school and study it. Get Find something you like and bring some unique values so that you can say, this is at least a starting point for what I, that doesn't need to be forever. You can always go learn something else later. True. The second thing I do is, uh, if you're going to go into industry, learn business. Understand that uh, when you're going to, you know, negotiate a salary for yourself, this is a mutualistic mm. agreement between you and the company you're working with, right? So this, this thing, as I, I try to use the language, I'm not working for Lockheed, I'm working with Lockheed, right? I'm their employee, but I'm, I'm trying to make sure I bring value and 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 make it so that they're getting a deal with me so that you know i can continue to advocate for myself say hey I, you know i'd like to I'd like a little bit of a raise or a bonus this sort of stuff a little bit more time off flexible work hours um because uh i you see you see in the news right there's there seems to be this strong contention between businesses and their employees and I think yeah. there's a lot of good reasons that that's the case, but I think that you can protect yourself from that a bit by, by, you know, learning a little bit of business acumen. And I think that that's something that, especially as I went through so much engineering schooling that wasn't taught to me in the engineering school. And mm -hmm. I dabbled in some like entrepreneurial crap <laughs> that I didn't realize how much it was going to pay off now because it makes it so that I'm a much more effective engineer because I also understand that there's some business development aspects customer relation aspects, sales aspects, these sorts of things are soft skills that really do help. So don't don't be afraid to, uh, you know, read up on those sorts of things. So you can have that conversation, you know, maybe add a little bullet point here or there on a resume. And then the, uh, the last thing is, uh, don't be afraid to be human. Right? Don't, don't be afraid to be human in that we talked about this extra dimensionality to, uh, mm. to people. I don't, the, the engineers I really like working with aren't just smart. They're not robots. I like knowing <laughs> which one, like if my coworkers will go to eat with me if I want to have a beer or we'll go rock climbing or we'll go camping or, or snowboarding, these sorts of things, right? There's, there's a human aspect that really makes these things uh, like move and groove, right? Yeah. So that's why, that's what I think we, we don't talk about enough when you get in into that academic space, 
right? That's so true. It's That's important so true. to learn what you want to, like what you're supposed to learn in college, but it's also really important to be like talking to people and knowing that <laughs> if I deal with someone you might not agree with, right? But That's still very true. To be productive because there wild. are lots of meetings that you end up in where I might have a different opinion than one of my coworkers. And you got to be able to talk about that in a place that you're on the same team, but you have different perspectives. And if you don't practice that, especially in engineering, you run into those engineers who are very smart and they have a different perspective, but they have a terrible time communicating that because you're like, I don't know if that person's just not listening to me or if they're just really bad at marketing their idea, but it just feels like maybe they are just like, like one track laser focused on I'm going to do it this way and I'm not going to consider anything else. And it's just, it's a, it's tough to work with them. You, so you want to try yep. to avoid being that sort of like defensive person. And by the same token, when you run into those defensive people, having the social skills to be able to, to draw mm. good collaboration out of them is also effective on the other side of things. Oh, that's great. I love those three pillars that you brought up. Try to find what you're passionate about. It's yep. on and on in college. And that's going to require you to try to take different classes. It took me a while to figure out what that was. Yep. Uh, get good at it. Um, said uh you understand the business side because like you said I, that was something i was completely unfamiliar with when they, they asked me like how much do you want to make or like what like what was your like minimum requirement i, I didn't even know what to say kind of and they luckily ended up <laughs> they luckily ended up offering me more than what i thought i was going to get so it, was, it worked out <laughs> but it doesn't it doesn't always work out that way so do your research because some companies might lowball you you know what i mean <laughs> And that's it's what, what you brought up is it's important to the, the, the business skills I'm talking about is to be able skills. to figure out what you think your value is. Your market, value right? is. Yeah. And yeah. The good thing is check tools like Glassdoor. Yes. You got Google. But Google, Google it and be honest, contribute to those data sets. So Glassdoor lets you put your salary in there anonymously. Help out, mm, the, next, help out. the next generation to know what's going on because that's that. Wild that that spans beyond companies with locality and stuff too right so you can you can do a little bit better figuring out what you're worth right to companies right and be i mean be honest with yourself right everyone yeah. there, there are the folks who are like yeah i should be ceo my first day you know, <laughs> you might have a learning to do. there might be a little bit of skills that that you're going to do for them but, but yeah that's, don't be honest, yeah that, be, honest be honest with yourself don't be delusional you know, but uh, do your research. I agree with that. And I love what you said about the human, be human, um, develop those soft skills, do those, join those social clubs and college, learn how to deal with confrontation, learn how to navigate people that, that, that uh, you may not agree with. Those are all things, honestly, that I struggled with my first year. I had to, and there were situations where I sent emails that were too assertive or I was in meetings and I, I missed, I, there was miscommunication and things, you know, can just be misinterpreted as, as being rude and I had to learn how to communicate in a professional way. Um, and that's so important because I realized, like you said, that'll get you a lot further. You know, when you when you're relatable and you have you have hobbies outside of work that people can relate to, they're more likely to befriend you and you're more likely to get those promotions. Not that you should be doing things to get things, but when you are a more dimensional, like multi-dimensional person, I notice people start to gravitate to more towards you naturally. So and that was a really good thing. I think I think that's when you start seeing those inflection points in careers, right? When people start mm. learning how to not just utilize their talents on the technical side of things, but you know, put that within context of teams and being able being able to elevate teams, being able to elevate collaborations. That's when you really start seeing people hit their stride and and you know really be able to run with it. Um, and I think I think that where you because traditionally, like you know. They say, oh, you need so many years of experience. I think a lot of those first years of experience are actually getting people those skills. Because a lot of people, True. you know, come out of college being able to take a Fourier transform. That's not the stuff they need to be taught. That's a great way to put it. It's it's the, you know, how how do I take a Fourier transform and know how to effectively get that across to someone else and make it mm. effectively effective in the context of a, a full group? Yeah, something powerful I heard someone say. I'm sorry, is my camera. Yeah, I think it's a little out of focus. Or... Oh, hold on, let me try to trick it. I, I moved around too much. Oh, I, I, I've only ruined it more. <laughs> I'm going to switch it off and back on. Do your thing. Okay, good. We're back. We're back. But that's a great way you put where every uh, coming out of college, we can all do Fourier transform. We can all integrate things. We can all, we know how to do basic MATLAB things. But 
like you said, if I've heard someone else say it once, if you can take very technical information to communicate that to people who maybe aren't as technically proficient, management, and you're gonna make a lot of money. You're you're gonna be somebody who can who can be a liaison, because I'm actually a liaison with my um, I'm a composite structure of liaison. So mm -hmm. I do some technical work, but I have to communicate it to people that are non-technical. Yep. And that was something I had to get better and better at. Um, but yeah, that's a great, great point. Um, but you know, getting towards the end, how how would you rate your company if you had to say pay, benefits, work culture? What would you give your overall company rating? I know you your boss you, you might not want to say anything if your if your boss is watching, but if you had to give an honest on a scale of one to ten, you know, job satisfaction, benefits, everything. I I think that the I think that Lockheed does um very, very well on all of those fronts. I think the one the one place that I'll I'll just the nothing's perfect. Right? Yeah, no, nothing's one, perfect. The, the downside I think folks will find at Lockheed is that it's it's a huge company, right? So if you want to be more of that like wheeler dealer startup, everything needs to be on fire. I like being under pressure. You're not going to find that as much here. There will be opportunities, but in my experience, that's not the, the case. So uh, if you're if you're someone who wants like a good paying job, good benefits, very, very clear expectations, uh, good, well-defined tracks for move up, these sorts of things, Lockheed is a great company. I would rate them super high on all of those fronts. The uh, They're not scrappy though, they're big. In order to manage 100,000 employees, you got to have rigid processes in place because otherwise the whole thing is going to end up as chaos. <laughs> yeah. So that's that's what yeah. that's what uh, if you're if you're someone who really wants that well-defined expectations, you know, good pay, good benefits, highly recommended. Highly recommended. The folks who really want a lot of chaos, uh, which they exist. Uh, those are the ones that I'd encourage to look a little bit closer at it before you take that plunge. Interview, make sure that when you're interviewing, you're asking those hiring managers like, hey, this is the sort of dynamic I'm looking for. Do you think this group will provide it? Because then it'll be a little bit more varied depending on which group you end up at and under which organization within Lockheed. That makes sense. That's, that's a great way to put it. Uh, these big companies, 100,000, Boeing, Lockheed, it's going to be very rigid so you, you have to have your control your expectations in terms of expecting it to be a small startup sort of so that's really good i'm glad that you rate your company pretty high but if you had to give a number 7.5 8 right now seven overall i probably a good solid like eight and a half to a nine. Oh wow i think that they that's are really good that well you know i i will say times are good the radar the radar group within locky is well funded so they are hungry for engineers which means they're Probably trying pretty good to keep us happy, uh, but I the I think that they're look I I I outside of engineering I've I've worked plenty of jobs since I was a teenager, so maybe just basic comparison. <laughs> like I've been a bartender before, I was a lifeguard, and it's a pretty good thing compared to those those folks. You've had all the odd jobs that young guys exactly. have. I went through that too. That's that's and, and with those describe it as, with those. There's just a little bit more variability, right? If you get yeah. a good bartending shift, it's really fun. If you get a bad bartending shift, <laughs> your hands are stuck. With, with engineering, and, well, at least engineering up here, it's like, yeah, job's pretty good all the time, you know? Yeah. You know, the I, bad days really aren't that bad, so. I agree. I agree. All right, so closing out, do you have any words of wisdom for young aspiring engineers? I, I would just, like, lean into it. Lean into the adventure. Don't. Don't try to get everything to go perfectly and don't expect everything to go perfectly because, uh, you know, throwing yourself at something and just seeing how it turns out is part of the game, right? Mm, you're yeah. you're going to apply to some jobs, you're not going to get called back. You're going to apply to some jobs that you're going to be like, there's not a chance these guys call me back, they can call you back, right? So just don't worry about it too much. Just enjoy the moment. That's some great advice. I agree. Uh, take, take risks, lean into it. Uh, everything's yeah. not going to go your way. I remember the same thing for me when I applied. I was actually trying to get into that like startup company in California. I was applying to jobs in San Francisco and LA, some small companies. And I had this like burning desire to get into it. And I would get some interviews and then I would get rejected. And I was kind of bummed out. And I actually got uh, the offer here in San Diego. It was the only place I applied to in San Diego, General Atomics. And it actually worked out better for me. It actually ended up being like 
I, I'm glad I worked for it. It's a medium sized company, about 10,000 or small. Yeah. But it, it ended up being something that was better suited to help tailor me towards being a better profession, developing my soft skills. So sometimes, like you said, lean into it. You might get rejected. Ro- keep rolling with the punches. You never know. Those opportunities are going to come, but you just got to be consistent. And um, as, as, the, as the follow on is, is that nothing's permanent. Uh-uh. You can find yourself 15 years into a career. And then even if you loved it, you yeah. I'm ready for something new and then throw yourself in the next thing. Virtually nothing's reversible. Virtually nothing's not reversible. Not reversible. Yeah. Yeah. The opposite of what I said. (laughs) (laughs) No, great. Uh, Well, thanks for letting me have you, Griffin. Uh, I really appreciate your advice. Um, If you guys have any questions, leave them in the comments and hit that like and subscribe video. I greatly appreciate it. But until next time, guys.